authority of the Bible, how, estab how established and how applied. And my question to you is, when you're riding down the road and you see a policeman or a state trooper step into the middle of the road and he goes like this to you, why do you follow that instruction? He's just a guy. I mean, you know, he's just somebody. Why, why is it that you get all nervous and, you know, you get all attentive and you pull that car over to the side? Why is that? Well, who gave him that authority? The state or local or federal government gave him the authority. But as you know, there are many people that don't respect authority, and they'll just keep going. They'll try to get away. What ends up happening? They pay the penalty, okay, for not coming under the authority of that person. If you're in a courtroom, and uh, I was watching a video clip one, one day, and I was watching this young lady. She was standing before the judge, and uh, she, uh, he didn't, she didn't like what he was saying. And so he told her, he says, well, we're going to have to rem remand you back into jail until you can get this, this thing squared away. And uh, she flipped him off, and she walked away. And he said, call her back, call her back. And he said, did you flip me off? She goes, yeah. He goes, well, that's another 30 days in jail. Then she got another attitude. He said, that's another 90 days in jail. So he said, we can keep on going if you want to. And finally, she kept her mouth shut and walked away. Okay, because one way or the other, Everybody in this room and everybody within the sound of my voice, and I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. We are under authority whether we like it or not. Okay. There are inanimate objects that we give authority to. They're not even people. Stop sign. A red light. A yield sign. No parking sign. All of these things we give authority and we give respect to and we don't go there. And if we do and we get a $25 or a $50 or a $75 ticket, we have no complaints because we didn't come under authority. So all of these things, and I, you know, some people say, well, I don't, I don't believe in authority. Well, let me tell you something. Yes, you do because you're under authority whether you like it or not. Okay. And if you don't think so, um, when you go to prison, you'll find out very quickly. You don't have any rights in prison. So we're going to talk about the authority of the Bible tonight. And uh, uh, one of the things I want to point out, first and foremost, is found in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 to 10. And I want to read it to you, and you can, you can mock it down if you want to, and then you can either listen or you can read along with us. Um, it says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. What Jesus was saying is, okay, I'll, I'll come into your home, and I'll pray for him, and, you know, and I'll heal him. But then the centurion says something very, very interesting. He says, Lord, I am not worthy. He says, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Wow. That's a respect of authority. He said, because I'm a man of authority. And he says, I go and say to this one, go and come. And he goes and comes. And I say to that one, go and come. And, and they, they obey my command. What he was saying is, is that, God, Jesus, if you come into my house, you're going to be under my authority because it's my house. And, Lord, I'm not worthy of that. I'm not worthy for you to come under authority to me. I'm, worthy to come, I'm not worthy to come under authority under you. And so Jesus goes on to say, because we've been talking about faith lately. And he says, And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and he goeth, and he come, and he cometh. And to my servant do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. And he said to him that followed, 
Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in all of Israel. It's the next verse, right? Next verse. You've got to follow me. Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. So what was he doing? He was comparing being under authority and respecting authority with great faith. You cannot have great faith if you're not under authority. That's very simple. Jesus said that. He said, I have not found in all of Israel. Think about this. He has not found in all of Israel anyone with such great faith as this man had. And this man was a sinner. But he respected authority. So what has happened in society? You see people today holding signs up, you know, uh, talking about the police, making derogatory remarks uh, against government, all of these things. So where did it all begin? Where did the, sh the, the paradigm shift come from that began all of this usurping of authority? Well, let's look at Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 15. And what's noticeable in this portion of scriptures is that five times, five times, you read the words, I will. I will five times. What that states there, and the emphasis of that repeated I will, is that the one that's being talked about is acting independent to authority. They're living their life in independence rather than dependence upon the authority that God has established. Look what it says. How thou art fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, Son of the morning, Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. For thou hast said in thy heart, not even an outward expression. How many times you've heard the expressions, uh, somebody will say, come to the altar. Or maybe Vicky will say, come to the altar. And people will stubbornly sit there and defy authority. Or they'll, you say, everybody stand, and people will stand, but they'll say, but inside I'm sitting. In their heart. That's exactly what Lucifer did. He said in his heart, I will, there's, there's the first one, ascend into heaven. Second one, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Verse 14, I will, this is the fifth one, ascend, oh, no, fourth one, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So we understand that the first rebellion or the first opposition to authority was found in heaven. And Lucifer took one-third of the angels with him. And when he did that, that began a whole scenario of things that was about to occur on earth. Understand that when that happened, that something cataclysmic happened to the cosmos. Something begin to turn. And so when God created the heavens and he created the earth and he created all of the trees and he created everything, he put man in the garden. So let's look at that, Genesis 2, 15 to 17. It says, And the Lord God took man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. 
And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Out of every tree of the, of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So here's the first commandment of the Bible. It's not the first ten commandments. Ten commandments is not the first commandment. This is the first commandment. Thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God had his reasons. God had his purpose. Because he wanted man to stay in the condition of being under authority. Under his protection. Amen? So I'm going to show you this illustration. If you'll put that up for me. You have God's authority and you have an umbrella. And under God's authority, on the side of obedience, you have God's delegated authority. How do we know God's authority? How does God exemplify his authority on the earth? It's through men. It's through leaders. It's through kings. It's through judges. It's through police officers. It's through pastors and prophets and evangelists and apostles all of the ones that he has appointed. So you have to ask yourself the question, okay, is the person you're sitting under, is he appointed or has he been voted? <laughs> if God's appointed him, then he has authority that is given divinely by God to bring instruction and correction and rebuke and all of those things that Timothy talks about to a pastor that's what a pastor should be doing. He should not be sugarcoating the truth. He should be telling you the truth because he sees from a different perspective than you do. And so when you have a pastor who is called and is under God's authority, is under the authority of others, we have a board of advisors here in this church. We have, we have deacons in this church. And when we're under authority, we are able to move in authority without abusing authority. Now, you know, there was a, what's called the shepherding movement many years ago, where the shepherding movement, where the, the pastor, you had to ask permission to wear certain clothes. You had to ask for permission where, to, where you could go. They were very controlling, and they abused the authority. And that's not what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about a pastor being under authority and you being under the authority of a pastor, is that when the pastor is, is preaching the word of God, that you are submitting yourself to the word of God, not to what necessarily what the pastor is saying, but you're, you're, you're taking it as what God is saying to you. In fact, there's a scripture like that. It says when you receive the word, it's as if you received it right from, right from the Lord. You ever read that in the scriptures in the New Testament? It's right there. Now, if someone's preaching something or teaching something contrary to the word, we'll get into that. So here you have God's authority. Then you have God's delegated authority. And these are the three areas of God's de uh, delegated authority. Number one, the family. And what happens is, is that God has instituted authority in the family. Now, the Bible says, now I know a lot of a lot of churches and people don't like this. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. The Bible says that God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of... Oh, I only got one person that said it. Come on, let's try it again. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. They don't like that. Oh, women don't like that. They don't like being under authority. But let me tell you something. If you're not under authority, now when I say under authority, I'm talking about someone who is instituting the principles of God's word. If you're, if you're, if you're married and you're under authority, but yet your husband wants you to do things that are unethical, like lie, cheat, steal, murder... <laughs> Okay, or, or, or he tells you, I don't want you being a Christian anymore. 
You don't have to listen. Because what he's done is he's abused the authority. Now watch what happens. If you take the family and the delegated authority that God has instituted in the family and you twist it out of order, and rather than having God's order, God is the head of Christ, Christ is the head of man, man is the head of woman, and you put it this way, man is the head of God, man is the head of Christ, the woman is the head of man. It's out of order, isn't it? What does the Bible say? That God does everything decently and in order. Why? Because he established that order. And a husband that truly loves his wife as Christ loves the church is not going to abuse his authority. Now sometimes, because women uh, seem to be a little more emotional than men, can I say that? Okay. And sometimes you have to assert a little authority. Say, no, we're not going to do that. Or no. And be firm. Or when a woman oversteps her authority into areas that she doesn't have authority in, what happens is that is rebellion. Not one amen? Come on, somebody give me one amen. I'm getting lonely up here. Okay? But I'm telling you the truth, okay? When you, when you, when you decide that you're not going to follow or get under God's protection of delegated authority, honor your mother and father. That's part of the children. When you children don't obey your parents, you know what happens? You're in rebellion. When you're in rebellion, you come under the satanic realm because I just read to you what happened to Lucifer. I will, I will, I will. He wanted to do what he wanted to do, not what the authority that he was under commanded him to do. And so when you take that structure in the family and the child says, no, I'm not going to do that. I want to do what I want. See, I will, I want, I want. You fall into that rebellion category of disobedience and you fall under the satanic realm and the only way that you can go in your life is destruction. And what happens is the fabric of the family gets torn apart because you're not following the pattern that God had for blessing. Look, under God's delegated authority, you're covered. But it's going to be done God's way. Now, you know, I mean, it's a personal thing, but, you know, some of the men, they want their, their wives to be slaves. Remember, your wife's not a slave. She's a help me. Amen. Amen. Treat them as a help me, not a slave. Not, you don't walk around with a superior attitude like I'm the man and you're going to listen to me because you won't get anybody to listen to you. You have to lead by example. Even at times when you want to say something and you don't, you just hold your peace. You have to come under God's authority. I'm finding that this is something that's happening now in our world that is, is just crazy how women are coming, not coming under authority and they're out there and holding signs naked, celebrating. I, there was one I, I read about celebrating, I think it was her 10th abortion. What do you think is going to happen to her? Yeah, God's judgment. Why? Because she's following rebellion. She's following satan the, the satanic realm. The ideology or the philosophy of the devil is to take everybody he can with him. And when he speaks to you and tells you, oh, you don't want to obey them, you don't want to come under their authority, and you begin to rebel against that authority, then you're going to reap the consequences of destruction. What does the Bible say? There is a way that seems right unto man, right? Seems right, but the end of that way is what? Destruction. 
That's why God gave the family and delegated authority to the family because in that divine order, the mother and the father hopefully are going to give their child direction and instruction. And where parents lose that authority is when they begin to identify with their kids. They start dressing like their kids. They start talking like their kids. They become their friend. And what ends up happening is the child loses respect because you've been placed in authority. You're a dad. You can be a friend to a degree, but you're a dad. You're a father. You have responsibilities and accountabilities. Now, some of you may be sitting there and say, what, what the heck do you know? You don't have children. Well, Paul didn't have children, and he gave advice on children. Come on. Why? Because I'm talking under the Holy Ghost now. I don't have to experience something to order to give truth. Come on, somebody. I can give you truth, and I, it's just as true for me. I have a lot of spiritual children, and I can tell you, I have experienced spiritual children that have disobeyed what I've said to them and they've reaped the consequences. Hello? I've told some, don't do that. Don't go there. What happened? They were disobedient. They fell into rebellion, and they almost were destroyed. Thank God God's grace pulled them out. Thank God they come to the senses. Like I said Sunday, Sometime God will have you not help a person. <gasps> I don't see that in the Bible, Pastor. The Bible, and the devil tried to hit me over the head with this scripture. Well, if it's in your power to meet the need, the Bible says meet the need. But that's not helping a person who is consistently living over here. Hello? So how do you justify that? The prodigal son. When he spent all of his inheritance, everything he had, he didn't want to be under his father's authority anymore. Hear me now. He didn't want to be under mom and dad's authority anymore. And so, he took his inheritance and he went out and he spent it all. Got all the prostitutes, had sex, had all the fun he wanted, drank, got high, did all the things he wanted to do. And then when he didn't have any more money, he didn't have any more friends. And then the Bible says he was getting a job slopping the pigs. Now, understand, he was Jewish. Jewish, that's unclean for a Jewish person to do that. And he had to go and wallow with the pigs and eat out of the pig st stuff. And the, but here's the clause that says this, and no man gave unto him. In other words, no man helped him. Sometimes God will put you in a position where nobody can help you because he's breaking your will, he's breaking you so that he can have your heart. And it's not that people don't care. It's just that they can't interfere or get into the place when God says, don't do anything. Turn them over to me. And that's what you have to do. You know the story in Genesis. The enemy comes through the serpent and says, has God said God really didn't say that? He didn't say that, you know, you shouldn't eat that. He said, but he's just jealous. He just doesn't want you to have what he has. And you know, he knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be as God's. This is the first time in the Bible ambition is mentioned. Hmm. You mean I can be like God? If I eat that thing, I'll be like God? Remember the words of Satan when he was Lucifer? I will be like the Most High God. The same tactics that he used in heaven against the rebellion, he's using right here in the garden. And the sad part about it is, these 
two, Adam and Eve fell from it. And they were perfect. Look what happened. When they ate, they finally realized something. The Bible says their eyes were open. Would they walk around with closed eyes? Bump it into trees? No, their conscience of sin and disobedience and rebellion was open. And they knew they were naked. Who told them they were naked? How did they know about naked? Because now they had knowledge, an openness to knowledge of good and evil, which before they were close to that. God was trying to protect them. God was trying to preserve them from all the hurt and the pain and the sorrow. Remember, God doesn't only see the, the beginning. He sees the middle and the end. He doesn't only see the present, but he also sees the future. And he knew that eating that tree of, of that knowledge of good and evil the, the impact on humanity it was going to have. And it says, when they ate, they noticed that they were naked and they covered themselves. And the Bible says God was walking in a garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Hear me now. Sin will hide the presence of the Lord. And churches that don't have the presence of God, you can be ten, 10 to 1. There's sin in the camp. I'm talking about deliberate rebellion, disobedience that is leading to destruction. Sad. I'm going to give you some quotes here from uh, three men of God that were very powerful in their time. This one is from C.S. Lewis. A creature revolting against a creator is revolting against the source of his own power, including even his power to revolt. It is like the scent of a flower trying to destroy the flower. John Calvin, for there, is no, for there is no one so great or mighty that he can avoid the misery that will rise up against him when he resists and strives against God. And Francis Schaeffer, he said this, the beginning of men's rebellion against God was and is the lack of a thankful heart. Come on. Proverbs 17.11 says this. An evil man, say evil man, seeketh only rebellion. An evil man seeketh only rebellion. In other words, that's the only thing that he is drawn to is to rebel, 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 doesn't care about authority, doesn't care about coming under authority. And when you're in that position, you fall back on that chart I was just showing you. And Maybe Jesse can put that chart back up for me. I guess in a moment. We're just reaching the family. What about... God's divine authority in government. The Bible says that they are ministers of God put there to restrain evil. You know what? We got all these people shooting cops, killing cops. Why? Because they don't want to come under authority. You know, in my generation when I grew up, I was taught to respect authority. I feared authority. 
When my dad, if I did something, and he looked above the rim of his glasses at me, I think Joe's laughing over because he knows that look. Probably saw it when I, with me one time or, or another. I backed off. I was like, I knew what was coming next, okay? Because I know that with every chance of disobedience, there is a consequence. I'm going to somehow pay the price for something I'm doing. And my mother used to tell my wife all the time, Bobby was a good boy growing up, right? You know, I tried to stretch the curfew a little bit. You know, when the lights came on, I stayed out another 10 minutes, you know, until my father would yell at the top of his lungs. And I could hear him all the way like a half a block or a block away calling me. And I knew all he had to do was call my name. He didn't have to say, get in here. He'd just yell out. And my father had a pair of lungs, believe me. And I, whatever I was doing, I dropped the bat, get my gloves. Sorry, guys, got to go. That was it. Because we respected authority. Now, as I got older, did I rebel? Yes. Did I pay the price? Yes. Yep. But God has put government to restrain evil. We may not always like it. Okay. I didn't like President, uh, President Obama. I didn't vote for President Obama, not because he was black. I, didn't, I knew his ideologies, and I didn't like what he, was, what he stood for. I knew he was a liberal. I knew he was a, he was a, a, a communist, really, with some of the people he hung around with when he was younger, socialist. And I knew he was a Muslim. And I don't care what anybody says. He, you can go sit in a Christian church all you want to. That doesn't make you a Christian. Like going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Just because a person goes to church doesn't mean they're a Christian. They may be affiliated, but they may not be converted. And then you have the church. Proverbs 17, 11, An evil man seeketh only rebellion, therefore a cruel messenger shall be sent against Hear me now. Listen. An evil man seeketh only rebellion. So if you're only rebellious, you're always going against the tide. You're always going against the rules. You're always going against what mom and dad says. And you're rebellious to authority. A cruel messenger will be sent against you. You'll find yourself in predicaments, in situations that if not for the grace of God and, and, and the, your parents that are Christians, you'd be in jail. Come on. Or you'd be blamed for something you didn't do and you'd have to go to court. And you'd have to uh, end up in probation or spending time in juvenile de uh, detention. Why? Because there's a cost. Always remember that. There is a cost to everything. In 1 Samuel 15, 16 to 23, the story about Samuel and Saul. And Samuel says to Saul, stay and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said to him, okay, say on. And Samuel said, when thou was little in thy own sight, in other words, when you were humble, when you were humble, when you were not a big shot, You were humble. Was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed you to be king over Israel? Pride is the number one reason why Satan fell, Lucifer fell. Because pride was found in his heart. But when you're humble, God gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. When you're proud, he resists. 
What, what does it mean to be proud? I don't have to do that. I'm not doing that. That's pride. You're coming under your own authority. But then he goes on, he says, Thou, he says, Wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed thee king over Israel, and the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherein, thou, wherein then did thou not obey the voice of God, but did fly upon the spoil, did evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I've obeyed the Lord. He's delusional. He's saying, oh no, listen now, who was Samuel? Who was Samuel? Prophet of who? Prophet of the assemblies of God? Prophet of the church of God? No, he was prophet of Almighty God. He spoke in the place of God. And he was telling him, didn't, God, didn't the Lord tell you to do this and you disobeyed the, the Lord's voice? He was giving him instruction. If I could put it in today's vernacular, if you did that to a person, you know what they say? You're judging me. He said, no, I'm obeying the Lord. He's delusional. He's not obeying the Lord. He's not obeying the word of God. He's delusional. He really thinks he, he was obeying God. Look what he says. Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord has sent me. What he's doing is calling the man of God a liar. Oh, you don't know. You don't, uh, Samuel, you don't know what you're talking about. Don't you understand? I'm the king. Let me get a drink. And then he blames the people. He says in verse 21, But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, sheep and things, which should have utterly been destroyed. To sacrifice, they took it for a reason, to sacrifice unto the Lord. And you know the famous scripture that everybody quotes? To obey is better than sacrifice. And, and Samuel told him that. Saul, you're the king, yes, but to obey is better than sacrifice. Obey God's word. Obey God's word. It's better than sacrificing. Some people say, well, you know, I'm not going to do what God says, but I, I'll give a I'll give a thousand dollars to missions. God don't receive that. You can't pay off God. You can't barter with God. Come on, somebody. And then in verse 23, he says this. Watch this now. For what? Rebellion is as the sin of what? What is witchcraft? What's the three characteristics of witchcraft? Intimidation, domination, and manipulation. When you manipulate your mother against your father so you can have your way, it's witchcraft. Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell my mother I'm sick so I can stay home from school. Oh, I'm sick. Oh, Ma, I can't go. I can't go. Oh, my poor little baby. Oh, you're sick. Oh, okay, stay home. Then by 11 o'clock, Ma, can I go outside? I'm feeling a lot better now. You know what I would do if I was the mother? Okay, great, automatic. Come on, get in the car. I'm taking you back to school. Finish up the day. Oh, I'm not feeling good again. That's manipulation. When you play the father against the mother, hello? Oh, you use the kids, parents? You use the kids? Or women? 
you don't do what I say, you ain't mm-mm-mm tonight. Come on. There are women that do that. Some men too. But rebellion in the eyes of God is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness. You refuse to budge on your opinions of what you think is right and what you think is wrong. You know what stubbornness is, uh, is equated to? Idolatry. You're worshiping your, you're worshiping your opinion. You're holding your opinions in high esteem above God's word. Oh, I don't have to obey that. Oh, that, I don't have to do that. You're going to fall into that umbrella category of disobedience. And you fall into the realm of satanic delusion and destruction. You are moving out from the umbrella protection of God. How many of you read the Old Testament? Right? How many times you see Israel in trouble? Over the same thing. I mean, sometimes you want to just hit the characters in the head and go, what's wrong with you? You know? Same thing over and over again. And there was a time when there was a lack of leadership in Israel. And in Judges 21, verse 25, it says this. In those days, there was no king in Israel, no authority. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Wow. The king is the one that brought judgment. The king was the one that brought counsel. The king was the one that set rules. So when there was no king, everyone does what's right in their own eyes. Today, if a pastor says something from the pulpit that offends somebody, and they're preaching the word, I'm not talking about telling people, boy, you know, uh, boy, you're ugly. I'm staring at you. Oh, pastor was staring at me when he made that comment about being ugly. I'm not going back to that church anymore. I'm going to find me another church. That's what we have today. People don't like to be confronted, so they want to go find a church that they feel comfortable in. But there's no correction. No instruction, no rebuke. And all the time that many of you have been in this church for many years, anyone ever hear me really rebuke one of you, personally call you out and rebuke you? If the Lord told me to, I would. Absolutely. But people don't want that kind of church. That's why you see churches with thousands of people in them. There's no confrontation. Everybody's somebody. The pastor is just like everybody else. We're all equal. No, we're not. If we're all equal, then guess what? You're going to get the same responsibility before God that I do, I have. And believe me, you don't want it. Because I'm going to give an account for every one of you when I stand before God. Did I tell you the truth? Did I speak the truth to you? Did I help you? Did I minister to you? Now, some people don't like that. But you've got to speak the truth in love. Amen? Because I love you. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in their own eyes. In other words... There was no respect for authority because there was no authority in place. 
Today, people get offended over the littlest, 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 littlest thing. They leave the church. And they forget about all the other things you did for them. When in fact, you should be praying, God, did you put me in this church? Yes, you did. God, did you tell me to come to this church? Yes, you did. Are you releasing me from this church? No. I believe you don't have a choice of where you go to church. I really believe that. You pray and you ask the Holy Spirit, and he tells you, I want you to go here. And I can prove that to be a fact. Annie, in the little church on Rockdale Avenue, heard about our church, okay, and didn't know me from Adam. Walked into the church, sat down, and God said, there's your pastor. And she said, but Lord, I don't even know anything about him. What did he tell you? And been here ever since. See, that's the problem. What was... Lucifer's problem, independence. I'm going to do what I want to do, and nobody's going to tell me what to do. Okay? I know people like that. I know Christians like that. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. That's pride. That's arrogance. And guess what? You'll fall under that umbrella. Now, if I tell you we're low on offerings, I want you to go out and rob a bank, then you don't have to do that. Okay? Please don't do that. Okay? Follow me as I follow Christ. Luke 6.46, I'm going to finish up in a few minutes. Luke 6.46 says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I tell you? To call him Lord means you're coming under the submission of lordship. Hello? When you say, or when you sing that song, He is Lord, He is Lord. Is he? If you're saying and confessing and you're speaking it out, that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then what you're saying is that you have come to this decision that it's no longer your will, but his will to be done. And when you recognize him as Lord, you are putting yourself under the submission of his authority and the authority that he inst instituted. Hello? Why do you think the Bible says, not all that say unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven? Because there are those who say he's Lord, but they've never submitted to his authority in their life. You ain't going to make it. You can call him Lord with your lips, but your heart will be far from him if you don't submit to his authority. Is this helping anybody? Romans 12, uh, Romans 13, 1 and 2 says this, Everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist are instituted by God. So then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. First Samuel 12, 14 to 15 says this. Now, if you fear and worship the Lord and listen to his voice, and if you do not rebel against the Lord's commandments, then both you and your king will show that you recognize the Lord as your God. But if you rebel against the Lord's commandments and refuse to listen to him, even his hand will be heavy upon you as it was upon your ancestors. Isaiah 1, 19 and 20. If you will not obey me, you will have plenty. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. If you will only obey me, you will have plenty to eat. 
But if you turn away and refuse to listen, you will be devoured by the sword of your enemies. The Lord has spoken. Look at this, Isaiah 63, verse 10. But they rebelled against him and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he became their enemy and fought against them. God turned against them for grieving his spirit. Where else do you see that in the Bible? Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Isn't it in the New Testament? Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit wants you to obey. You're here. It's a powerful service. God's presence is overflowing in this place. And there's a call for you to come to the altar. And you feel that tug of the Holy Spirit to bring you to the altar. But something, oh, no, I'm not going. Come on. It's because God wants to accomplish something here. But don't just think, well, if God wants to do it, he can do it right there in his seat. He said that to Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Here's God talking to Jeremiah, right? Make believe you're Jeremiah. 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 Go down to the potter's house, and there I will speak with you. You can say, well, God, you're speaking to me now. Why don't you just tell me right now? Why? Because God's looking for obedience. Naaman, go dip in the river Jordan seven times. Oh, that filthy, murky, dirty water. I'm a king. You come. What are you talking about? I'm not going to do that. Then stay in your leprosy. He wants obedience. Satan was, Lucifer was disobedient. That chart I showed you, disobedience and obedience. One is rebellion, one is blessing. Look, obedience, God's protection, family, government, church. You've got favor and protection. Come on. You see the tragedies that are out there. God's protection. Rebellion leads, listen to me, rebellion leads to the hardening of your heart. The more you rebel against authority, the harder your heart gets. It gets hardened and hardened and hardened. Look at the scripture. Hebrews 3.15. Remember what it says. Today, if you will hear his voice and harden not your heart, as in the provocation. Put that in NLT for me. Remember what it says today when you hear his voice. Don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. Rebellion brings a hardening of heart to the point where you do not want to obey God at all. Don't let rebellion rest in any of your hearts. There are people today, Christians and pastors, who rebel and say that God doesn't care. You know, we're under grace. God don't care. Malachi 2.17 Malachi 2.17 says this. I'm almost finished. We must not rebel against the word of God. But this is what Malachi said. You have wearied 
the Lord with your words. And the questions they asked were, well, how did we weary you with our words? You asked. You have wearied him by saying that all who do evil are good in the Lord's sight. And he is pleased with them. You have wearied him by asking, where is the God of justice? Oh, you know, well, God, you know, the Lord is good. All who do evil are good in the Lord's eyes, you know, and he is pleased with them. No more judgment. Don't you hear that today? Are we in a time when evil is called good and good is called evil? Who do you think is twisting that around? Lucifer, Satan. Everything God does, he twists around. He manipulates. He dominates. And what else? Intimidates. He intimidates you. If you discipline your kids, you know, they're going to hate you. And then you tell your kids something, and he goes, I hate you! <laughs> I don't, see, I know if I did that, he's going to hate me for the rest. Who said that? What did you say? You get over it? Yes. Exactly. But you know what? We get so so hurt and so intimidated. I'll never forget this. I'll just tell you about intimidation. I was at my my my, my wife's mother's house one day. We're all sitting around a table. And um I think I was the last one on the table. Everybody had left, gone into other rooms or gone into the parlor or whatever. And I had a cup of coffee. And my wife was, I guess she was angry at somebody or father-in-law. I don't know. And my, my mother-in-law, she was the most kind, loving person. She, she loved you. But if you got on the bad side of her, mm -hmm. okay. I mean, when you stab your son in the hand with a fork, <laughs> you know, that tells me something. Anyway, we were there, and she was so aggravated, she said, I've had it. That's it. I'm going to kill myself. So I grabbed my cup of coffee. I said, please let me know when you're done. And I walked out into the parlor. I wasn't being insensitive. What, was I, what I was doing was I was challenging that intimidating spirit. I was trying to get me to, oh, poor thing, don't, you don't want to do that. Oh, you gee whiz. You know, that's what we do today. We coddle people. Stop coddling. You're an enabler. You're an enabling that person not to change. I sat down, and I, I don't know if Linda said to me, this, what's going on? I said, she'll, she'll be here in a couple of minutes. Sure enough, a couple of minutes later, she's there. She's in the parlor with me. We must not rebel against God's word. A word. Listen to this. Proverbs 28.9. I'm going to close with this. I have a few more, but I'll, I'll close with this one. Proverbs 28.9. Put that in King James. I like that better. He that turns away his ear from hearing the law, God's word, even his prayer shall be an abomination. In other words, you turn your ear away from instruction. You turn your ear away from God saying something to you and teaching you. Even your prayer shall be an abomination to God. No, we're not robots like the Catholic Church. Hear my prayer. I ain't going to hear your prayer. I said that one time to somebody, and somebody in the con my congregation got mad at me. They wanted me to pray for somebody. 
for something. I said, I'll pray the prayer of salvation, but I'm not going to pray for God to bless them because I can't bless them. They got all angry. Why don't you just pray for the person? I said, read the Bible. The Bible says when that person was healed and the, the Pharisees started giving him a hard time, he said, well, we know that God doesn't hear sinners. Hello? The only prayer God hears about a sinner is, is a sinner's prayer of repentance. So when people ask for people to pray for unsaved people, don't pray for God's favor. They're living in rebellion. How's God going to bless rebellion? Hello? Or they tell you, I don't want nothing to do with this Jesus you got. Just pray for me that God will bless me, that God will heal me. But I don't want to be saved. I don't want, I don't want salvation. I just want the benefits. Well, can I tell you something? You can't have insurance unless you pay a premium. We've, we've taken prayer and extended it out to unbelievers, even God-haters, and, and they, they come and they want prayer. For what? So they can continue living in rebellion, can continue living in adultery, continue living in drunkenness, continue living in drug addiction. But they just want to get out of their sick circumstance and situation. I'm not praying that prayer for anybody. I'm sorry. I'll pray that God will reveal himself to them so that they will get saved. And once they get saved, then God will begin to restore the years that the canker worm and the palm worm had destroyed. But you can't get the years of the canker worm and palm worm destroyed unless you turn your heart back to God. Does this help anybody? Amen. Let's be under God's authority. Amen. And let's not fall under that category of being under the enemy's authority, where he can come in and the door's open and he'll destroy and he kills and he robs us when we don't come under authority. Let's pray. Father, we just ask right now, God, that we will come together and we will pray and we'll seek your face, God, and do what you say because there's blessing in it. God, you have, you're so wonderful and so loving and so kind and so gentle. You are all those things to us, not so that you can put up with us, but that, God, we will submit ourselves to you. You have no greater joy than to see your people walk in truth. That's what the Word says. Lord, even our own selves, when our children do achievements, and they do good, and, and, and we're so proud of them, and we, we, we just praise them because they've done so well. That's what you want to do to us. But, Lord, we have to obey you. We have to walk in your ways. So, Lord, help us to be under your authority, under the authority that we're under, whether it's family, government, or church. And let's recognize that it's not just a bunch of rules but, Lord, you have placed statutes and commands for us to obey that will keep us in line, keep us right, keep us safe under your authority. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. Now be with us as we go. Protect us, God, from the onslaught of the enemy. We bind all aggressive drivers against us in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, use us to reestablish God not only in our family, but in the government and in the church. Biblical authority, biblical respect for authority, and ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.